Hello, and welcome to The Essential Reads. My name is Isaac, and my goal is to bring you a bunch of classic audiobooks in an easy and accessible way. This show is brought to you by my store. You can purchase all of my audiobooks there for five bucks. It is one of the easiest ways to support me in turning this, not just from a hobby and uh, something I do on the side, but into my full-time job. Let's get started. Animal Farm by George Orwell Chapter 10 Years passed. The seasons came and went. The short animal lives fled by. A time came when there was no one who remembered the old days before the rebellion except Clover, Benjamin, Moses the Raven, and a number of the pigs. Muriel was dead. Bluebell, Jesse, and Pincher were dead. Jones, too, was dead. He had died in an inebriate's home in another part of the country. Snowball was forgotten. Boxer was forgotten, except by the few who had known him. Clover was an old stout mare now, stiff in the joints and with a tendency to roomy eyes. She was two years past the retiring age, but in fact no animal had ever actually retired. The talk of setting aside a corner of the pasture for superannuated animals had long since been dropped. Napoleon was now a mature boar of twenty-four stone. Squealer was so fat that he could with difficulty see out of his eyes. Only old Benjamin was much the same as ever, except for being a little greyer about the muzzle, and since Boxer's death, more morose and taciturn than ever. There were many more creatures on the farm now, though the increase was not so great as had been expected in the earlier years. Many animals had been born to whom the rebellion was only a dim tradition passed on by word of mouth, and others had been bought who had never heard mention of such a thing before their arrival. The farm possessed three horses now, besides Clover. They were fine, upstanding beasts, willing workers and good comrades, but very stupid. None of them proved able to learn the alphabet beyond the letter B. They accepted everything that they were told about the rebellion and the principles of animalism, especially from Clover, for whom they had an almost filial respect, but it was doubtful whether they understood very much of it. The farm was more prosperous now and better organised, it had even been enlarged by two fields which had been bought from Mr. Pilkington. The windmill had been successfully completed at last, and the farm possessed a threshing machine and a hay elevator of its own, and various new buildings had been added to it. Wimper had bought himself a dog cart. The windmill, however, had not, after all, been used for generating electrical powers. It was used for milling corn, and brought in a handsome money profit. The animals were hard at work building yet another windmill. When that one was finished, so it was said, the dynamos would be installed. But the luxuries which Snowball had once taught the animals to dream, the stalls with electric lights, hot and cold water, and the three-day week were no longer talked about. Napoleon had denounced such ideas as contrary to the spirit of animalism. The truest happiness, he said, lay in working hard and living frugally. Somehow it seemed as though the farm had grown richer without making the animals themselves any richer, Except, of course, for the pigs and the dogs. Perhaps this was partly because there were so many pigs and so many dogs. It was not that these creatures did not work after their fashion. There was, as Squealer was never tired of explaining, endless work in the supervision and organisation of the farm. Much of this work was of a kind that the other animals were too ignorant to understand. For example, Squealer told them that the pigs had to expend enormous labours every day upon mysterious things called files, reports, minutes and memoranda. These were large sheets of paper, which had to be closely covered with writing, and as soon as they were so covered, they were burnt in the furnace. This was of the highest importance for the welfare of the farm, Squealer said. But still, neither pigs nor dogs produced any food by their own labour. And there were very many of them, and their appetites were always good. As for the others, their life, so far as they knew, was as it had always been. They were generally hungry, they slept on straw, they drank from the pool, they laboured in the fields. In winter, they were troubled by cold, and in summer, by the flies. Sometimes, the older ones among them had racked their dim memories and tried to determine whether in the early days of the rebellion, when Jones' expulsion was still recent, things had been better or worse than now. They could not remember. They had nothing to go upon except Squealer's lists of figures, which invariably demonstrated that everything was getting better and better. The animals found the problem insoluble. In any case, they had little time for speculating on such things now. 
Only old Benjamin professed to remember every detail of his long life, and to know that things never had been, nor ever could be, much better or much worse. Hunger, hardship, and disappointment being, so he said, the unalterable law of life. And yet, the animals never gave up hope. More, they never lost, even for an instant, their sense of honour and privilege in being members of Animal Farm. They were still the only farm in the whole country, in all of England, owned and operated by animals. Not one of them, not even the youngest, nor even the newcomers, who had been bought from farms ten or twenty miles away, ever ceased to marvel at that. And, when they heard the gun booming, and saw the green flag fluttering at the masthead, their hearts swelled with imperishable pride. And the talk turned always towards the old heroic days, the expulsion of Jones, the writing of the Seven Commandments, the great battles in which the human invaders had been defeated. None of the old dreams had been abandoned. The Republic of Animals, which Major had foretold, when the green fields of England should be untrodden by human feet, was still believed in. Some day it was coming. It might not be soon, it might not be within the lifetime of any animal now living, but still it was coming. Even the tune of Beasts of England was perhaps hummed secretly here and there. At any rate, it was a fact that every animal on the farm knew it, though no one would have dared to sing it out loud. It might be that their lives were hard, and not all their hopes had been fulfilled, but they were conscious that they were not as other animals. If they went hungry, it was not from feeding tyrannical human beings. If they worked hard, at least they worked for themselves. No creature among them went upon two legs. No creature called any other creature master. All animals were equal. One day, in the early summer, Squealer ordered the sheep to follow him and led them out to a piece of waste ground at the other end of the farm which had become overgrown with birch saplings. The sheep spent the whole day there, browsing at the leaves under Squealer's supervision. In the evening, he returned to the farmhouse himself, but as it was warm weather, he told the sheep to stay where they were. It ended by the remaining there for a whole week, during which time the other animals saw nothing of them. Squealer was with them for the greater part of the day. He was, he said, teaching them to sing a new song for which privacy was needed. It was just after the sheep had returned, on a pleasant evening when the animals had finished their work and they were making their way back to the farm building, that the terrified neighing of a horse sounded from the yard. Startled, the animals stopped in their tracks. It was Clover's voice. She neighed again, and all the animals broke into a gallop, and they rushed into the yard. Then they saw what Clover had seen. It was a pig, walking on his hind legs. Yes, it was Squealer. A little awkwardly, as though not quite used to supporting his considerable bulk in that position, but with perfect balance, he was strolling across the yard. And a moment later, out from the door of the farmhouse, came a long file of pigs, all walking on their hind legs. Some did it better than others. One or two were even a trifle unsteady, and looked as though they would like to have had the support of a stick. But every one of them made his way right round the yard successfully. And finally, there was a tremendous baying of dogs, and a shrill crowing from the black cockerel. And out came Napoleon himself, majestically upright, casting horsey glances from side to side, and with his dogs gambolling round him. He carried a whip in his trotter. There was a deadly silence. Amazed, terrified, huddling together, the animals watched the long line of pigs march slowly round the yard. It was as though the world had turned upside down. Then there came a moment where the first shocks had worn off, and when, in spite of everything, in spite of the terror of the dogs, and the habit developed through long years of never complaining, never criticising, no matter what happened, they might have uttered some word of protest. But just at that moment, as though at a signal, all the sheep burst out into a tremendous bleating of Four legs good, two legs better, four legs good, two legs better, four legs good, two legs better. It went on for five minutes without stopping, and by the time the sheep had quieted down, the chance to utter any protest had passed, for the pigs had marched back into the farmhouse. Benjamin felt a nose nuzzling at his shoulder. 
He looked round. It was Clover. Her old eyes looked dimmer than ever. Without saying anything, she tugged gently at his mane and led him round to the end of the big barn where the Seven Commandments were written. For a minute or two, they stood gazing at the tarred wall with its white lettering. My sight is failing, she said finally. Even when I was young, I could have not read what was written there. But it appears to me that the wall looks different. Are the Seven Commandments the same as they used to be, Benjamin? For once, Benjamin consented to break his rule, and he read out to her what was written on the wall. There was nothing there now, except a single commandment. It ran, All animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. After that, it did not seem strange when the next day the pigs, who were supervising their work at the farm, carried whips in their trotters. It did not seem strange to learn that the pigs had bought themselves a wireless set, were arranging to install a telephone, and had taken out subscriptions to John Bull, Tin Bits, and the Daily Mirror. It did not seem strange when Napoleon was seen trotting into the farm garden with a pipe in his mouth. No, not even when the pigs took Mr. Jones's clothes out of the wardrobes and put them on. Napoleon himself appearing in a black coat, rat catcher breeches, and leather leggings, while his favourite sow appeared in the watered silk dress which Mrs. Jones had been used to wear on Sundays. A week later, in the afternoon, a number of dog carts drove up to the farm. A deputation of neighbouring farmers had been invited to make a tour of inspection. They were shown all over the farm, and expressed great admiration for everything they saw, especially the windmill. The animals were weeding the turnip field. They worked diligently, hardly raising their faces from the ground, and not knowing whether to be more frightened of the pigs or the human visitors. That evening, loud laughter and bursts of singing came from the farmhouse, and suddenly, at the sound of mingled voices, the animals were stricken with curiosity. What could be happening in there, now that for the first time animals and humans were meeting on terms of equality? With one accord, they began to creep, as quietly as possible, into the farmhouse garden. At the gate, they paused, half frightened to go on, but Clover led the way in. They tiptoed up to the house, and such animals as were tall enough peered in at the dining room window. There, round the long table, sat half a dozen farmers and half a dozen of the more eminent pigs, Napoleon himself occupying the seat of honour at the head of the table. The pigs appeared completely at ease in their chairs. The company had been enjoying a game of cards, but had broken off for the moment, evidently in order to drink a toast. A large jug was circulating, and the mugs were being refilled with beer. No one noticed the wandering faces of the animals that gazed in at the window. Mr Pilkington, of Foxwood, had stood up, his mug in his hand. In a moment, he said he would ask the present company to drink a toast. But before doing so, there were a few words which he felt incumbent upon him to say. It was a great source of satisfaction to him, he said, and he was sure, to all others present, to feel that a long period of mistrust and misunderstanding had now come to an end. There had been a time, not that he or any of the present company had shared such sentiments, but there had been a time when the respected proprietors of Animal Farm had been regarded, he would not say with hostility, but perhaps with a certain measure of misgiving by their human neighbours. Unfortunate ideas had occurred, mistaken ideas had been current. It had been felt that the existence of a farm owned and operated by pigs was somehow abnormal and was liable to have an unsettling effect on the neighbourhood. Too many farmers had assumed, without due inquiry, that on such a farm a spirit of licence and indiscipline would prevail. They had been nervous about the effects on their own animals, or even upon their human employees. But all such doubts were now dispelled. Today, he and his friends had visited Animal Farm and inspected every inch of it with their own eyes. And what did they find? Not only the most up-to-date methods, but a discipline and an orderliness which should be an example for all farmers everywhere. He believed that he was right in saying that the lower animals on Animal Farm did more work and received less food than any animals in the country. Indeed he, and his fellow visitors today, had observed many features which they intended to introduce onto their own farms immediately. 
He would end his remarks, he said, by emphasising once again the friendly feelings that subsisted, and ought to subsist, between Animal Farm and its neighbours. Between pigs and human beings, there was not, and there need not be, any clash of interest whatever. Their struggles and their difficulties were one. Was not the labour problem the same everywhere? Here it became apparent that Mr Pilkington was about to spring some carefully prepared witticism on the company. But for a moment, he was too overcome by amusement to be able to utter it. After much choking, during which his various chins turned purple, he managed to get out. If you have lower animals to contend with, he said, we have our lower classes. <laughs> this bon mot set the table in uproar, and Mr. Pilkington once again congratulated the pigs on the low rations, the long working hours, and the general absence of pampering which he had observed on Animal Farm. And now, he said finally, he would ask the company to rise to their feet and make certain their glasses were full. Gentlemen, concluded Mr. Pilkington, gentlemen, I give you a toast to the prosperity of Animal Farm. There was enthusiastic cheering and stamping of feet. Napoleon was so gratified that he left his place and came round the table to clink his mug against Mr. Pilkington's before emptying it. When the cheering had died down, Napoleon, who had remained on his feet, intimated that he too had a few words to say. Like all Napoleon's speeches, it was short and to the point. He too, he said, was happy that the period of misunderstanding was at an end. For a long time there had been rumours, circulated, he had reason to think, by some malignant enemy, that there was something subversive and even revolutionary in the outlook of himself and his colleagues. They had been credited with attempting to stir up rebellion amongst the animals on neighbouring farms. Nothing could be further from the truth. Their sole wish, now and in the past, was to live at peace and in normal business relations with their neighbours. This farm, which he had the honour to control, he added, was a cooperative enterprise. The title deeds, which were in his own possession, were owned by the pigs jointly. He did not believe, he said, that any of the old suspicions still lingered, but certain changes had been made recently in the routine on the farm which should have the effect of promoting confidence still further. Hitherto, the animals on the farm had a rather foolish custom of addressing one another as comrade. This was to be suppressed. There had also been a strange custom, whose origin was unknown, of marching every Sunday morning past a boar's skull which was nailed to a post in the garden. This too would be suppressed, and the skull had already been buried. His visitors might have observed, too, the green flag which flew from the masthead. If so, they would perhaps have noted that the white hoof and horn, with which it had previously been marked, had now been removed. It would be a plain green flag from now onward. He had only one criticism, he said, to make of Mr. Pilkington's excellent and neighbourly speech. Mr. Pilkington had referred throughout to Animal Farm. He could not, of course, know, for he, Napoleon, was only now for the first time announcing it that the name Animal Farm had been abolished. Henceforward, the farm was to be known as the Manor Farm, which he believed was its correct and original name. Gentlemen, concluded Napoleon, I will give you the same toast as before, but in a different form. Fill your glasses to the brim, gentlemen. Here is my toast. To the prosperity of the Manor Farm. There was the same hearty cheering as before, and the mugs were emptied to the dregs. But as the animals outside gazed at the scene, it seemed to them that some strange thing was happening. What was it that had altered in the face of the pigs? Clover's old dim eyes flitted from one face to another, but some of them had five chins, some had four, some had three. But what was it that seemed to be melting and changing? Then, the applause having come to an end, the company took up their cards and continued the game that had been interrupted, and the animals crept silently away. But they had not gone twenty yards when they stopped short. An uproar of voices was coming from the farmhouse. They rushed back and looked through the window again. Yes, a violent quarrel was in progress. There were shoutings, bangings on the table, sharp suspicious glances, furious denials. The source of the trouble appeared to be that Napoleon and Mr. Pilkington had each played an ace of spades simultaneously. Twelve voices were shouting in anger, 
and they were all alike. No question, now, what had happened to the faces of the pigs. The creatures outside looked from pig to man, and from man to pig, and from pig to man again. But it was already impossible to say which was which. November 1943 to February 1944 the end. Thank you so very much for listening. If you enjoyed, please like, comment, share, all that jazz. And if you really enjoyed, do subscribe because there's more to come. And if you're listening on podcast, please leave a review. It helps get this in front of as many people as possible. And it would really make my day to read some reviews. I really hope you enjoyed this much. I really hope that you enjoyed this book as much as I do. It is my favourite book that I believe I've ever read. And I'm really, really, really glad that I got to share it with you. Once again, thank you for listening. And until next time, bye-bye. The next book will be out shortly.